Coming up on Tech News Today, it's our CES preview show. We're going to be at the Consumer Electronics Show all this week. So we're going to tell you what we think are the best, biggest trends from tablets to 3D TVs to thin TVs to a Verizon iPhone. We'll talk about it next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, January 4th, 2011. Tech News Today is brought to you by Ford and Voice Activated Sync with My Ford Touch. Make calls, play music, and more with Sync and My Ford Touch. Available exclusively on Ford, Lincoln, and Mercury vehicles. For more information and online demos, visit SyncMyRidePodcast.com. And by MailRoute.info. MailRoute is a secure hosted service that provides enterprise-grade virus and spam filtering to companies of any size. Try it right now, absolutely free, at MailRoute.info. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I am Becky Worley. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is our CES Trends show. Uh, those of you watching live know this already, but we're taping it on Monday uh, because we're all going to be winging our way to the Consumer Electronics Show, uh, kicking off on Thursday, although coverage begins on Wednesday. And uh, we got a couple guests to help us give you a good preview of what we might expect out of the Consumer Electronics Show. Joining us, Editor-in-Chief of PCMag.com, Lance Ulanoff. Welcome, Lance. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Also, Chris Knoll of uh, the Intuit Small Business Blog, editor of the Intuit Small Business Blog, and the Good only morning. person who's been on Tech News Today that I have not been on Tech News Today with. <laughs> Tom, All meet right. Chris. Chris, Happy meet Tom. <laughs> nice to meet you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise. So, thank you both. Uh, thank you all for, for coming in and, uh, and uh, talking CES with us. We'll start with the, uh, the trend. we we'll just get it out of the way, the one that every headline is going to go with, tablets. There's going to be a ton of tablets, right, Becky? Yeah, I've already heard uh, some of my producers and folks contacting me about CES have said, yeah, it's all about the iPad killers, right? And, there you go. You know, we had iPhone killers and the threat thereof for so long. And now that the Android tablets are going to be rolling out, um, definitely there's a lot of talk about this. And what I'm seeing so far, and I should just say up front, this, this is going to be like a like a bad episode of Karnak, you know, from the Johnny Carson show, um, because I know a bunch of stuff under embargo, and I can't remember what's under embargo. Uh -oh. and what's not. Recipe for disaster. <laughs> so I'm going to just speak vaguely so I don't <laughs> totally blow it and pull a gizmodo. But um, anyways, I, you know, I see a ton of different form factors. And one I know that we're already, we saw last year, we're going to see iterations of, for example, um, the Entourage Edge, which is a dual screen. One side is, a, you know, a tablet. The other side is an e-reader. We're going to see all kinds of crazy form factors coming out with Android. Don't you guys agree? Oh, absolutely. It's it's Android's going to be one of the big winners out there uh, because uh, a lot of a lot of companies that build hardware aren't too thrilled to build Windows Seven tablets, and they'll only do it if they put a special overlay on it. So everybody I talked to over the past six or seven months, they step away from Windows Seven for tablets. They go with Android. Uh, you know, we've already got Vizio has already announced their stuff. Uh, Toshiba has announced their stuff. Uh, and I, I will say that I don't see as many different form factors. What I see is frightening similarities. Mm. You're not going to be able to tell one of these things from another. I absolutely agree. And this is going to be a repeat of the PC race back in the 80s where every company you ever heard of or, or never heard of is going to be jumping into this fray and trying to put out a tablet and uh, you're not going to be able to tell any of them apart and uh, come this time next year uh, you aren't going to be able to find most of these companies uh, even with a Google Earth's not going to be able to find them. It's going to be that. They're going to be that obscure now. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do you differentiate these? I mean, a, a, a tablet, you, you've got a couple of ways you can go with the ports, USB port, HDMI port, this or that. But really, exactly. it's, it's mostly touchscreen. And if you're running Android, it's all about how you skinned Android, right? 
Uh, well, what about the pull-out, the idea of the pull-out keyboard, which is sort of funny because isn't that then a notebook and not a tablet? But, you know, that's one thing we've heard of is there's the possibility of the slide-out keyboard on some of these. Um, but I agree. It comes down to ports. It comes down to cameras. Um, and then I think the point being made about Vizio is really good, which is here's an ecosystem where you've got a tablet, you've got a phone, and you've got a TV all running in the same operation operating system and able to talk to each other. Um, so the ecosystem idea, I think that has um, more more uh, weight perhaps than the hardware features that identify the tablets. And, and which company thought of that first? I'm trying to remember. They start with an A, uh, as something, <laughs> they made some pad. Something, something. Right, something. But you know, I will say that the, the easiest way to tell the difference among these products is the iPad and everything else. <laughs> you know, that is really what you've got here. And so few things that I've seen up to this point have even compared. We are turning a corner. Uh, here's something interesting to pay attention to. We've got Android 2.2, uh, which is Froyo. Then we've got Android 2.3, which is Gingerbread. And Gingerbread is the one that we're seeing some tablets on. But the really important Android, which is called Honeycomb or 3.0, is going to be in short supply at this event because Honeycomb won't be done until later this year. So we're in kind of an odd space for Android tablets. The companies are all trying to get in there and make sure they got their Android tablets ready, but the OS really isn't ready for them. Yeah, so uh, and, uh, typical at CES, you're going to see a lot of devices that people won't let you touch or, <laughs> or, or will only demonstrate for you because they're in prototype mode and they're not going to actually do things the way that they hope they will do when they release them. Do you guys think that the, the big differentiator will be price point? I mean, we're already seeing, um, you know, the folks who did one laptop per child talking about we're going to get one tablet and we're going to bring the price way, way, way down. Um, is that going to be the differentiator in the story? Even though it's a fractured marketplace, at least it'll be so cheap that people can get into it with tablets? You can buy that cherry pad. What does that cost, like uh, 198 or something like that? Uh, I don't think price is going to be the ultimate differentiator. They may try and differentiate on that stuff, but it's going to be on the quality of the, what that point you made about Vizio is so important because you have to deliver this sort of holistic experience. A tablet is kind of like one brick in your house. When you deliver it, you really have to deliver all the other bricks too, or they feel like it's an incomplete product. So if you see a really cheap Android tablet, it's probably not going to have a lot of other things going on around it. In fact, uh, the, I think the, the key to this, uh, and, and Chris, I want to hear your thoughts on this too, is is differentiated tablet from a, an MP3 player. We see a Galaxy, I, what's it called? The Galaxy Player uh, that's going to be shown off as well, which is essentially an Android tablet shrunk down as a competitor to the iPod Touch. And, you know, that's a that's a good example of Samsung has done a great job as Vizio is trying to create their own ecosystem. Samsung has really gotten in front of this idea of having connected TVs. They have obviously the Galaxy Tab and they've had a ton of success um, with the Galaxy S. So why not take it into a hugely successful product that can just uh, kind of create a vertical in this niche that they have around Android products. Now, if they can tie them all together um, and I don't know if it's been released or not, but I have an inkling that that very product you're talking about is going to help to tie together their entire ecosystem also. Now, Chris, you were going to say something about the whole ecosystem. Uh, yeah, I think I think uh, if you you have a great another another great analogy with uh, last year's big talk of CS, which was e-readers. Uh, we saw maybe a dozen e-readers then, and how many are really competitive today? A year later, two, uh, Amazon and the Nook. Um, and this is exactly what we're going to have it. I mean, what what happened to all those e-readers? There's no books for them, so there was no ecosystem. And now, like you're seeing, you're seeing this again. I, in fact, you're seeing e-readers be rebranded as tablets, uh, and uh, that's going to be a repeat this year. And we're going to see uh, a few of them succeed because they do have that ecosystem, and many of them fail. A slight detour on this too. I'm wondering, as we talk about all of these products tying together, how does Google TV fit into this? I haven't quite figured out if we're going to see TVs with their own Android operating system and Google TV separate, or are these the same animal? 
You could, I, I definitely think you could see TVs uh, with the OS built in. That's the beauty of the Android OS, this free and open OS that you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, you've seen that in the phone space. You see that elsewhere where people can, they can either sort of work closely with Google and integrate all that stuff, or they can kind of go their own way. Uh, no matter what, you know, because one of the other trends, obviously, at every CES are HD TVs. What are they going to do with it this year? We've had 3D TVs for the last few years, but internet connected TVs, which we saw last year and a little bit the year before, uh, they're going to be a very big part of this. And they're going to be more than connected. They're going to be functional. They're going to have the, the ability to accept widgets. Yahoo's been doing connected TV stuff for a while. Uh, they don't always tell us the platform that they're using, but it may serve them well this year to sort of pump up, oh, we're actually using Android because then more people pay attention to them. I don't know if they'll use Google TV. Google TV is having trouble. I, I read an article on Engadget, I think it was on Gadget today, about uh, Vizio having Google TV built in, but wrapped in their own interface, similar to that Yahoo Widgets interface they have in their internet-connected TVs already. Uh, so I, I wonder if we'll see a lot of different plays on how they integrate Google TV, different from what we've seen from Sony. Yeah, overlay flavors. I talked to the Vizio guys last week, and um, they said they're going to skin it, you know, in their own in their own flavor, which kind of bugs me. It's like, isn't that the whole point of having a ubiquitous operating system that you can lay across a bunch of different devices? But somehow, hardware manufacturers just can't let go of that branding. Well, and I guess if you're used to the Yahoo widget interface on the previous Vizio TVs, then this would keep you familiar with that. But I'm not sure how big of an advantage that really is. Mm, yeah. I, I think that whole market is so fractured. There's so many different overlays, so many different interfaces. You get uh, every single device you buy gives you the Internet and gives you an interface. Every um, cable provider gives you Internet you know, functionality, widgets. That's a different interface. Uh, you know, you could stack them all up on top of each other and completely block out your HDTV. Uh, I, I think that we're going to have to see some sort of shakeout post CES. At this point, we'll just see for this show, we'll see a lot more, which will be more confusion, but eventually it'll all boil down. Yeah, I think Lance is right. It's right now it's a it's a race to how how many different features and different platforms you support. Do you have Pandora? Do you have Netflix? Do you have X, Y, and Z? And Google TV will be a checkbox on that for now. Um, and yeah, I think there needs to be some uh, some sort of standardization and some sort of shakeout. One thing I haven't seen in advance of CES as many press releases for is boxes, set-top boxes like a Roku or a, or a Boxy or something like that. Do you think we'll see more of those on the floor? Uh, because last year, you know, there was it was pretty much Boxy. Uh, I think Western Digital had had their My TV out there and, and a couple of others. I was expecting to see a lot more people jumping into that marketplace. That's my death knell. I, I think that actually we're going to see less and less of these. Um, and I, I go back to what Steve Jobs said. There's very little um, go-to-market strategy for set-top boxes because we've been um, taught as consumers that they should be free, that we get it bundled, and now we're getting them built into our new TVs. Do you guys agree or disagree? I agree, and I am, I'm, one of the, I'm actually a confused consumer right now. Something interesting happened to me over the holidays. I got a new HD TV and a Blu-ray player to go with it. I also got, uh, I was, as a gift, Apple TV. I haven't hooked up Apple TV yet because I'm trying to figure out what more it's going to give me than I'm currently getting from my DN DLNA connected TV, which also has internet access, sees my network. And you know, I think that when you see an extra box, you're like, why do I want that extra box? Well, you will get many advertisements for products on iTunes. I know that. <laughs> oh, awesome. <laughs> Super. Yeah, I agree. I, I have a I have a hundred dollar Roku box and a hundred and thirty dollar LG Blu-ray player, and the uh, the LG player plays Blu-ray and and does everything that the Roku box does now. So yeah, I think Becky's right. This is a this is a dying market already. Uh, already. All right, uh, we'll find out a, another dying market. I want to talk about 3D TVs uh, in a second here. But first, I want to thank uh, Ford, makers of voice-activated sync, for their uh, sponsorship of our special coverage of CES 2011, brought to you by Ford and voice-activated sync with my Ford Touch. Uh, connects you to your vehicle in new and interesting ways. In fact, keep an eye on our CES coverage, because Alan Mulally, uh, CEO of Ford, is going to have a keynote announcement. Uh, sync responds to voice commands, touch controls, true hands-free calling, plays your music, you just get in the car, you talk, and it does what you want. 
It'll it'll go through your playlist. It'll skip songs. It'll send text messages. It'll read text messages to you. Uh, it's a much safer way to interact with your phone and drive uh, if you need to do that. It, it actually allows you to do that somewhat safely. My Ford Touch includes an 8-inch touchscreen in the center stack, too, so you can mess around with the settings, change the lighting in your car, five-way switch pads on the steering wheel, three LCD screens. With Sync and My Ford Touch, you can switch between voice commands and touch controls on the fly, and Sync understands more than 10,000 voice commands. Available exclusively on Ford, Lincoln, and Mercury of vehicles, we invite you to experience Sync with My Ford Touch this week. Go to a Ford dealer near you. Try it out. Jump in. Mess around with the settings. Play around with them. Show, you know, put it through its paces. Or you can view an online demo at SyncMyRidePodcast.com. Thanks to Ford for supporting our special coverage of CES 2011. And thanks to Lance Ulanoff and Chris Knoll and, of course, Becky Worley for joining me uh, on this preview episode. Uh, last year, 3D was one of the top buzzwords along with the e-readers that we talked about earlier. And this year, it's not going away, but it's not new I guess the, the, the two new things I've noticed is I saw I saw a press release for 3D audio, so the buzzword is starting to seep into other areas. <laughs> uh, and, there, and there's also uh, the idea of throwing in uh, technology for passive 3D, which means the glasses would be cheaper. Yes. Yeah, which I'm excited about. Passive uh, 3D is what you get in the movie theater. means no technology in the glasses, just the, the screens, uh, and they're lighter, they're easier to wear. Um, I actually saw a pair, there's a pair, Oakley has um, passive uh, lenses that you can buy. They're, they're, they're not sunglasses, they're 3D glasses, they're expensive, but you could use them with these new passive TVs or in movie theaters. Vizio's got, uh, I know, one coming out, a passive 3D TV, so does LG, and uh, they're also going to be a lot cheaper. But I don't think anybody in 2011 is going to buy a TV simply because it has 3D. You know, if that's a feature, it's a checkbox on there, that's fine. And if it's cheap and the glasses cost $15, that's fine. But uh, I think people learned their lesson in 2010. It was too much hype, not enough substance. Agreed. And, I, you know, I can't say the manufacturer, but I know for a fact uh, one little metric that will support what Lance is saying, which is uh, a 3D TV set in the 42-inch range that debuted last year from X manufacturer is going to get a slight refresh. It'll be a slightly, you know, upgraded version, and it'll be $600 less than the manufacturer suggested retail price last year when they debuted it at CES. So what we're seeing is that 3D isn't a feature that people are willing to shell out big bucks for, and the manufacturers are responding. I, I think what you'll see at CES is uh, these booths are going to be stacked with these 100-inch TVs, and they'll be having big presentations, uh, and everyone... Uh, is showing off the color and uh, how awesome these TVs are, and nobody is watching because they're all around the corner, huddled around a 10-inch tablet that the company makes, and that uh, <laughs> has, it has under glass over there. Yeah, I, I, thought, right. <laughs> I thought that there would be a big 3D story this year if we saw finally 3D without glasses. And I know the technology is not there, and everybody said it's not there, it's not there. But you just kind of hope, oh, maybe somebody's going to break it wide open at CES. And except for one company that has either sandbagging me or I haven't, they haven't responded to my emails, I'm not seeing the 3D without the glasses. We're seeing it in a, a, a one company that's got it in a, a car system, uh, which makes me feel carsick just thinking about yeah. it. And then obviously in some of the handheld devices. I saw I saw Sharp, a rumor Sharp, that there Sharp were, has it. Sharp has it. Okay, I was going to say I saw a rumor that one company would actually be showing it off, but of course, w w showing it off and actually having a shipping model that they're willing to sell are two totally different things. Yeah, Sharp is Sharp is nowhere near uh, productizing what they have. They showed it to me um, at the Mobile D conference, and it's it's quite impressive. I think it does use lenticular technology, which is basically sort of like what you have when you were a kid. You look at that picture of Niagara Falls, and it would actually look 3D, uh, uh -huh. but they've they've enhanced it it's a lot better than that and you take photos 3d photos and you view them right on the back of the device and they're 3d that was pretty impressive and toshiba is the company that's talking about that they have a 3d uh tv that without the need for glasses but i think it's quite small but if you recall you know the early days of led tvs and uh, still oled tvs uh, they're small, they start small and they got bigger. So we know at some point this is going to be solved, which is, by the way, another reason that consumers are so hesitant to dive into the, the active 3D space when they know that something better is coming down the road. 
I said last year, I think 3D will catch on because they'll just start putting it in all the TVs they sell. And that kind of looks like the way it's going. They're just cutting the prices and saying, fine, you know what? We're going to make you take 3D because we're not going to give you that many other options. And content is the other inhibitor, Tom. And I can't say um, who this is about, but I'm just going to say two words, streaming 3D. That will change things if it really happens. And I'll oh, say, they have that in France or something, the adult channel. Yeah, one of those uh, ne one of those countries <laughs> that has bandwidth. I think they have streaming 3D. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, we mentioned smartphones briefly. There, uh, smartphones usually are not a big deal at CES because you got Mobile World Congress, you got CTIA, you've got places for people to make their big announcements. Uh, but they're hard to ignore. So I think we're going to see a lot of people touting their smartphones. Are we going to see any big announcements though? Anything new? 4G. I think we we'll see some 4G handsets. I think that's that's my sense of what's really out there. I don't think we're we'll gonna see anything groundbreaking. Uh, you know, there's there's no new OS to sort of wrap things around. You know, we except for Windows Phone 7, but we've already seen those devices. Uh, so my take is that the really big innovations come uh, during Mobile World Congress. Yeah, and if yeah, PlayStation think... Phone had come out, then maybe that would have been the big mm -hmm. phone story. But no. Nah. I think Microsoft's going to try to play up uh, Windows 7 as the big thing at CES, although everyone is now going to say, well, didn't this come out a few months ago? Uh, that's the Microsoft way. Yeah, I think so. I mean, <laughs> I and, mean. and we'll talk about the keynotes in a, in a little bit, but the Windows Phone 7 is not a big announcement at CES, although I guess it's not impossible that they can come with some new hardware device that we hadn't heard of, but they're they're not that good at protecting leaks that I think we wouldn't have heard if there was something really big coming. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Also, uh, something I read in, in Lance's column, uh, location-based services, uh, especially as it pertains to cars, I think we're going to see a lot of automobile inno innovation with screens in the cars and the ability to give you information based on where you are. And I think that's just, you know, that's the next logical step. You know, you've got your connectivity going. Uh, we get these 4G networks out there. You're driving along. You're you're always connected wherever you go. But it also, it knows positionally, you had GPS in the car, knows where you are. So what's the most obvious thing? You know, to deliver you lots of location-based uh, information right on uh, your heads up, you know, your screen, your display. That's really what I'm expecting, that basically the car goes from having computers in it to help it work to becoming a rolling computer, which I guess everything we have seems to be turning into a full-blown computer, but uh, we should be used to that by now. Yeah, Wi-Fi in the car is not brand new, but, but it seems like I've seen a few press releases touting it as a big announcement. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, you know, I th I think that that was sort of a, a, the idea of that being the Wi-Fi hotspot in the car. Mm, it seems a little bit kind of like this is my car phone, this is my car router. Um, it's a little Gordon Gecko for me because you're sort of tied to it. Um, but the other thing is, I think that there are big announcements coming from Audi. Ford has a big announcement, and Toyota has a big announcement. They'll be at the show. And so I think it's actually creating more ubiquitous connectivity with smartphones as opposed to adding new features. Now, one company that's also going to be doing something that's not groundbreaking but definitely um, evolutionary is Taser. They have car technology that they're unveiling that is for parents who have new drivers, um, teenage drivers. So <laughs> I like where this is <laughs> Wait a minute. You're not supposed to zap the kids while they're driving? <laughs> no, it's, Don't tase me, Mom! It's when they're grounded and they try to drive the car? Is that uh, no, how? What, what is, what is If this? they go 57 miles an hour, they get a little <laughs> zap! <laughs> it's basically smartphone integration and reporting back to mom and dad. Okay. So, um, again, I can't remember if this is out or not. There was a big Wired article written about it a few months back, but it was in development. Um, so I know that they're going to be debuting um, that technology at CES. So I think, as again, I don't think it's the big revolutionary story. I think it's evolutionary. All right. Uh, we got a couple more things uh, we want to wrap up. Uh, near field communication, smart appliances, and the keynotes. Are we going to see a Verizon iPhone? But first, I want to thank our other sponsor for today's show, MailRoute. If you have gotten a spam email, 
Uh, I, I know probably most of the people on this panel have never gotten one, but 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 maybe some <laughs> of, maybe some of you out here have. Uh, it's one of those unsolicited emails. Mail route is a way to stop the spam. If you if you run your own account, even if you if it's just a small web hosting uh, where you rent the web host and you've got your own domain name and you have your email going there, Mail route can reduce. 95% of that crap email from getting into your account. And when I say 95% of the crap email, I mean 95% of your email is crap, and it's going to get rid of it. I have resurrected acedetectedsubbrilliant.com by using MailRoute. Uh, it was just overwhelmed with spam. It wasn't worth using anymore. Running, Changing my MX record, running it through MailRoute.info, I now have no spam in that inbox. It's incredible. So check it out. You can sign up for free as a Twit listener and give it a, give it a whirl, MailRoute.info. And if you decide to sign up for the service, you'll receive a 10% discount for the life of your account. That's less than $30 per user per year uh, for single users. Visit MailRoute.info and sign up with the email filtering service that Leo uses, and I use it too. All right, uh, near-field communications is something we've seen in the Nexus S, and I've seen it sprinkled around in a, in a couple of uh, press releases, a couple of announcements. This is the idea that you're going to be able to use your phone or your device that has NFC on it to pay for things. But there's other possibilities as well. Have you guys heard of anything interesting that we might see? I haven't heard of any specific um, products. I know that Google is testing this um, right now in Portland. Um, with a bunch of manufacturer, a bunch of um, merchants there. So I know that there is sort of beta testing of how this would work, and they're not exactly doing it for payments right out of the gate. They're seeing it more initially as like a, a super duper QR code. Um, so I know that they get the, they realize that with NFC, they have to start slowly because public adoption is going to be slow and people are going to be hesitant. But it seems to me like the opportunities are huge. Right. You, you it's, know, it's great. Thing, I would you, I would love it. I would love to be able to pay for things with my cell phone instead of having to get out of my wallet. But everything I've seen for CES is about chip makers and people who are going to do the back end of this stuff. And I haven't seen any products coming yet. So, so this is actually nice, uh, you go got ahead, that Lance. nice opportunity to uh, butt pay instead of butt dial. <laughs> with, uh, <laughs> Oops. But uh, I, you know, one of the really interesting things about this technology is it can be used in a passive way. So just the way you browse the web, you jump from site to site and sites cookie you and they pick up little bits of information that's, that's anon it's an anonymous, but it gives sort of demographic info. Uh, that's the way near field communication can work. You walk into this store, you walk into that store, you go to a library, you go to a museum, you're building a pattern. Uh, they're building up sort of demographic information that can all be collected in a totally passive way because you're walking by the transponder. It's, it's, it's actually can be it can be really significant from a data collection uh, standpoint. The one thing I will say about this that's not NFC driven, it's more something that is kind of like an obvious thing. Two things come together. So uh, when the iPhone came out, we had hardware, all these docking stations and these third party hardware makers who are bringing out their speakers and their this and that for the iPhone and the iPod. Then we had apps and apps were totally separate animals. Well, what I'm seeing as a trend is the marriage of apps and third party hardware. So let me give you an example. One of the things that I'm going to be demoing on Good Morning America is an app that's tied to a Bluetooth meat thermometer. And so you can figure out what the temperature is the, of your meat that's on the barbecue is using your iPhone from up to 200 feet away. Um, dumb, silly, but a good indication of where the technology should well, go. It's not uh, necessarily, go. That's not totally new, though. I've seen these wireless meat thermometers. I guess, is it the app that's the new part of it? It's the app plus hardware yeah, all okay. married onto the phone. So basically, another example is like a blood pressure cuff that's now transmits the information directly to an app that's on your iPhone, and that information can then be shared with your caregiver or created in a database that you can go into the doctor and say, here's my history. So I think that the marriage of the hardware and the, and the app is interesting. I'm going to be wearing one of those body uh, body fit meters or whatever it's called. Body bug. Yes. Body, what's it called again? Body bug, I believe. Yeah, but That's not, one of them. Body. Yeah, it's, it's, it's basically it's Bluetooth device going to go to the phone. It's going to track. It's going to see whether or not I'm the most so-called active blogger at CBS. <laughs> <laughs> go Lance. Go Lance. You can do it. <laughs> well, it, it, since CES is immemorial, we've we've had promises of your refrigerator connected to the Internet. Is that is this where smart appliances are going with this kind of stuff? 
I, I, think I will not absolutely. rest until my refrigerator can Facebook what I ate that evening. <laughs> oh, you oh, are Chris. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll know why you're not the most active blogger. That's right. Mm. <laughs> I'm, One I'm smart appliance we're going to see I've seen that's kind of that. cool. Oh, go ahead, Lance. You go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I know that uh, Whirlpool, Kenmore, uh, these guys are all promising to sort of show you the, the, the next generation of, of intelligent, so-called connected, uh, aware appliances, you know, that can tell you when your clothes are dry or or tell you if there's some sort of state that needs to be changed within the device, you know, oh, is it time to do that, that, that run through that sort of cleans me out? Uh, you know, most of our appliances have a lot of technology in them anyway. Uh, years ago at CES, I saw one that could accept barcodes to know how to cook foods. So, you know, this is again, next logical progression. We should see devices that too, that probably have companion apps that may go on something like your iPad. Um, two other smart appliances I wanted to throw out there. Um, iRobot has a couple of new Roombas. The one that's most interesting is a new scuba, you know, the mop. And it's small enough that it cleans around the toilet. Thank you, God. That actually sounds interesting to me. Um, and then the other one that I really like is a furniture company called Key, K-I. And they have basically power mats built into the countertops on some of their tables and their countertop materials so you can do um the wireless charging like you do with the power mat and i could just imagine that in the future like a little spot in your counter that's all set up for electromagnetic charging and you just throw your phone or your um you know tablet down and it charges that way maybe not right away but i see that as a trend all right let's finish up with uh keynotes uh, obviously, everybody starts with, uh, every year starts with Microsoft. <clears throat> for, the, for starting last year, it was Steve Ballmer instead of Bill Gates. Uh, so are we going to see a reprise of last year's keynote? Will they just pull out the same old points and say tablets again? Uh, <laughs> or, or, or as we were talking about, are we going to see some Windows Phone 7 stuff? Are we going to hear anything about Windows 8? I hope hmm. we hear something about Windows 8. I am, I, I've been pressing them, like, please tell me something. Tell me nothing. Uh, they're very hesitant to say anything, but they need a surprise. Windows 7 doesn't cut it. Uh, the tablets, the, Bomber will not be embarrassed again. HP essentially ended up embarrassing him with the HP Slate, which finally came out in Windows 7. Uh, HP won't market it. Uh, they don't care about it because they want to do the web OS version. So I don't think that you're going to see him standing up there saying how wonderful Windows 7 is for this particular tablet. They're probably talking more generalities, but he needs something. He needs some sizzle. Is he going to have, maybe he'll have Conan back. <laughs> <laughs> no, Leno. Go way back. Go way back to Leno. Leno. <laughs> God, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it is so weird. It's everything old is new again with the tablets. Um, I'm interviewing Steve Ballmer on Thursday morning. I'm hoping he'll play connect with me is what I really want to get him to do. Um, but, you know, I think that a big story for Microsoft and whether they tout it in the keynote or not is just the reinvention of the company. Um, they're doing so many interesting thing was, things, whether it's their voice technology with Ford, whether it's um, the connect and how all these different um, uses for the Connect camera. We've heard rumors about um, new functionality for that Connect camera and what will that bring. Um, so I think it's going to be Microsoft, you know, whatever they're on, 7.0, the, the new Microsoft. And I want to hear what their vision is uh, as they move forward with their new businesses. Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. I mean, there, there is nothing that Microsoft can surprise us with right now. They're not going to bring out Windows 8 yet. It's way too early. Um, the phone stuff, the tablet stuff, connect. I mean, these are all these are all cool things, and uh, I think Microsoft can get up there and say, "Look, this is not this is not your grandfather's Microsoft anymore. We're a new company, and we're we're going forward." Now, if they could just get rid of Balmer, things will be oh. things will be all good. I don't think he'll I, announce I'm that. Taking, I'm, taking <laughs> no, probably not. Many, I'm taking bets on how many times they say to the cloud. Yeah. <laughs> it's right, a little bingo, a little drinking game we, <laughs> might, might be involved with that. The, uh, there's lots of other uh, interesting keynotes, of course, uh, but but the other one that's receiving a lot of attention is Ivan Seidenberg of uh, Verizon and the, the ridiculous, in my opinion, rumors that he might announce the Verizon iPhone on stage at CES. That's not going to happen. Steve Jobs is not going to allow that to happen. So the, the real speculation is how will this Verizon iPhone be referenced? How will it be? announced uh, will we will we get an invite shortly before seidenberg's uh, uh, announcement will the invite come at the announcement to some apple event uh what, what do you guys think 
Why does I, it I all have to happen at the same time? Yes, oh. that's what I think. I, I agree. <laughs> January is a cruel month. Cruel, cruel month. I think that, that all of us are anticipating that Apple's going to have something going on this month. I'm honestly hoping that we don't hear from them till later in the month. Uh, I'll look for the iPad 2. I don't know if they'll wrap up the iPhone with that or maybe they'll space it out. They'll have something to do then, something to do in, say, maybe uh, February or March. But who knows? It, you know, Would Apple like to steal the thunder of the entire CES show? Sure. Didn't Google try and do that with the Nexus One last year? Yes. I mean, I and learned Apple about did that it when two I was years ago. Yeah, they've done it before. I don't put it past them mm. to do it again. I think you're totally right, Lance. No, I, I'm, I'm going out on a limb and saying we are not going to hear about iPhone on Verizon in January, period. From anyone. Uh -huh. From anyone. Interesting. Wow, predictions. Now, a couple interesting things. So Bloomberg says that we will hear about Verizon iPhone by the 14th of February. That's their drop dead deadline. And then the other thing is that there's an iPhone update that's scheduled for January 7th. Does that make anyone else suspicious? No. <laughs> no, and you know what? Bloomberg has made so many iPhone predictions. Uh, I don't even listen to that anymore. I mean, that, that has to be the half half a dozen of these with specific dates and specific details that they know for a fact and never has happened and won't Chris, happen Chris, they have unnamed sources and so does the Wall Street <laughs> Journal, okay? Perhaps that's the right, bug well, in that the case, you're right, you're right. That January 7th update is the bug fix for the iPhone alarm. Yes, that's what I think. <laughs> Seriously, I'm pretty sure that's what that is. <laughs> Uh, they're like, look, we have to fix this finally. Uh, if anyone didn't hear, the, the iPhone uh, had another alarm glitch. They had one at Daylight Savings Time, and they had another one on January 1st. It is now over, they say, uh, but but you got to fix that. You can't have another one. We're going to have Daylight Savings Time ending, you know, and then we're going to have another glitch. And all these poor <laughs> iPhone users will be sleeping in, and it will ruin the productivity of the country and send us into a double-dip recession unless it's yeah. fixed. <laughs> All right, so I think Verizon will probably see, we'll hear them talk about LTE a lot. That They're going to talk about 4G. They're going to talk about their phones. I think that's safe to say. Who knows uh, when, if we will hear about a Verizon iPhone. But thank you all. Uh, we'll know within a week uh, about all of this stuff. Uh, so, folks, be sure to, to keep it at Twit. If you want to see the show and save your feet. Uh, you can watch live.twit.tv. Leo, myself, Brian Brushwood, Sarah Lane, Becky Worley will be covering the show floor. You'll see a whole lot more than we will by watching our stream because True. we'll actually be walking around. Uh, and a, an, a, another great way to, to follow the coverage of, of the details of what came out. And one of the resources that I use is PCMag.com. Thanks, Lance, uh, for coming on the show and uh, let folks know more about your CES coverage. Yeah, thanks for having us on. we got a whole cs.pcmag.com. Uh, we're all over it. We're also on Twitter with their account. Um, and it's, the stories are flowing. They're blasting at us, really. Uh, we're overwhelmed. But i got to put my running shoes on now to head over to CES. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you need extra souls. Chris Knoll uh, from blog.intuit.com, Intuit Small Business Blog. You're headed to CES as well. What are you going to be looking for? I am. I'm doing a little more uh, laid-back CEOs this year. Uh, no meetings, heading the show a little more uh, casually. Uh, actually going to walk around for once instead of spending the whole time in hotel rooms when those NDA meetings that I don't actually get to talk about. We are very no, jealous of you. No, you're a bum. You're such a bum, <laughs> a Noel. Bum. I'm so jealous. This was, is true. I was going with the tactful, nice way of saying he was a bum, but Becky, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Chris. And, and thank you, Lance. Uh, once again, don't forget our CES coverage begins. Well, we'll be doing uh, Tech News Today live from I'll be in uh, Las Vegas on Wednesday. And then we'll be doing it from the show for, floor Thursday, Friday and Saturday morning. Uh, so, Becky, you got you got your running shoes on? I'm with you, bud. All right. I'm, I, I won't even sleep. I got like a full pot of coffee that I've already packed with me. Just I'll see you on Friday. OK. <laughs> All right. We'll see you in Las Vegas, folks. Uh, Twit.tv slash TNT is the place to find our show's uh, information. You can get the link to the wiki with all the show notes and everything there. Uh, you can give us a call, 260-TNT-SHOW. Leave us a voicemail. Let us know what you think. Or send us an email, TNT at Twit.tv. We'll see you at CES.